book of Matthew, chapter 4, from verses 18 to 22. I will read the calling of the first disciples. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks very much, Sam. Now this morning, we are celebrating with Beth, Grace, Hannah, Nicole and Reuben their baptisms into Christ. For each of them, it's the next and vital step in their journey with Jesus. Jesus came to give us life and life to the full, as it says in John chapter 10. Baptism is a vital part of faith in Christ. Uh, as faith is declared and we publicly become a part of God's family through this this sacrament of baptism. But what next? I indeed, what are the signs and marks of any Christian? Or put another way, how do we give it away? How do we let on? How do people notice? Well, that's really what we're going to talk about this morning. Because I'm starting a new series. We're starting a new series on the mission methods of Jesus, seeking to answer the question, how did people help others how did Jesus help others to find faith? Let me, let me pray first. Lord God, as I come to um, speak this morning, we, we ask that your Holy Spirit would please come. We ask that he might come and graciously take my words and speak through them to all of us. And we pray your Spirit would be at work in us, Lord, that we might hear and respond to what you're saying to us today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So this sermon series is, uh, there are going to be six sermons in the series spread over the coming three months, so it's not going to be every week, partly because we've got a couple of visiting speakers, uh, and also because we've got some important Christian festivals coming up, including Ascension and Pentecost, and we want to celebrate the Ascension of Jesus and the gift of God's Spirit to his church as well. So uh, it'll be over the next few weeks, and we're going to be looking at how Jesus shared the good news of the gospel. How did he proclaim God's kingdom? Uh, and he did it in many ways, but I'm just going to look at, at, at five ways, and then there'll be a sort of rounding up sermon at the end. He did it through his presence. We'll talk about that this morning. He did it through parables, through power evangelism, through persuasion, otherwise known as apologetics. He also did it through prophetic evangelism, you notice they're all Ps. Uh, just help me remember them. Uh, and, and then finally, the sixth sermon will be, uh, uh, will be ending with taking the gospel into the whole world. Okay, so that's, that's where we're going in the series. And the reason for the series is simply this. The most important person in human history is Jesus, the man who is also fully God. The events of his life, in particular his birth, death and resurrection, matter to all of us, every human being, whether we realise it or not. Because without Jesus, we are lost forever. And somehow, somehow, God has drawn us and so many others to faith in Christ. He, used, he has used different means and methods to help us to find Jesus. And they have often, if not usually, involved other human beings. 
Uh, I would also say that clearly it's a ministry of the Holy Spirit that convicts our hearts as well. But, but uh, on a human level, what we can see with our eyes is we would say this person or that person was involved in my journey to faith. Uh, and there are different things that hinder our coming to faith in Jesus. Because, well, that's the reality of being human. But truthfully, God wants us to know him, to be in relationship with him, to be his beloved children. And for different people, different things cause us to want to explore faith for ourselves. For some of us it was this, for others it was that, and for some of us it was multiple things. And of the six things I've listed, some of us just want to know intellectually that the faith is true, that's where the apologetics, the persuasion comes in. Some of us just want to have a supernatural encounter with God, that's where power evangelism comes in. Some of us just want to know God's presence. You know, it can be lots of different things for us, but as they come together and as God ministers and meets with us, we come to faith in Christ. But we have to start by looking at Jesus, of course. Jesus spent much of his earthly ministry trying to help people overcome barriers to true faith so that they could put their faith in him. The reasons why we are doing this series is that ultimately faith matters. As human beings, it's good to know why we're here, what we are here for, and what is our destiny? And above all, we need to know that we are loved. Rene Descartes wrote, Cogito ergo sum. Usually translated into English as, I think, therefore I am. As his first principle of philosophy. Someone once, um, once said, I'm pink, therefore I'm spam. But we won't go there this morning. Uh, the point is... I think, therefore, I am, is what Descartes came up with. But he's wrong. Our true identity is found in being loved. Our true identity is found in being loved. Descartes should have written, I am loved, therefore I am. Jesus came to show us how much we are loved by Almighty God himself. And since Jesus has perfect theology, he is God after all, we can and must learn from him on how we convey the love of God that leads to faith. And so in the series, we're hoping to overcome those barriers that prevent us encountering that love of God. This week, we start by looking at presence. As we listen to the story of the fisherman that, uh, that, that uh, um, Sam read for us, as we listen to that story of those fishermen going about their daily labor, we read of Jesus turning up and simply inviting them to follow him. And he then walks on a bit further and calls James and John, who are in the same trade, and asks them too to follow him. And they all do. His presence leads to an invitation, which leads to faith. Luke in his gospel in Luke chapter 5 gives us a bit more of the story. Luke tells us that as Jesus was speaking to the people, they were crowding around him, uh, which became a bit too much. So he got into a fishing boat, which pushed out a little bit from the shore uh, and began to teach the people as he was seated. And after he'd finished teaching, he told the fishermen to put their nets down into deep water for a catch. They hadn't caught anything all night, but they did it because Jesus said so. Uh, and they, of course, caught a huge catch, Jesus then tells them from now on they will fish for people. And they pull up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. And so we hear that call in both Luke's account and Matthew's account. Jesus basically saying to these guys, follow me, follow me. And the reason why in our reading those four, those four fishermen left everything, was because Jesus was someone whose presence they had encountered. They had seen him around. They had heard some of his teaching, but most of all, they'd encountered the person that is Jesus. They'd seen him teaching, they'd seen him doing miracles, but those were not the things. For them, fundamentally, it was the encounter with Christ. Later in Matthew's Gospel, 
Peter remembers this call in, in Matthew 4. He remembers this call. And it never left him. In chapter 19, verse 27, he says to Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. So this encounter with Jesus that caused them to leave everything was remarkable. Jesus is and was and is an extraordinary person. All ages loved him. Think about how children wanted to be with him. He spoke of God in personal, understandable terms. He called God Father. He talked of his relationship with God. And he showed the difference that God can make in a life and to a life. Quite simply, Jesus is amazing. And turning to Christ, that phrase we heard declared by our five candidates today, that, that phrase uh, happens because someone has introduced them to Jesus. It's life transforming. Jesus' presence enabled many to follow him back in the first century. They listened to his call and they followed. Their lives were changed forever. Jesus himself talks about being born again, about the need for us to be born again. And the Apostle Paul talks of those who become Christians, Christ followers, how they are new creations. There's this sense that when we trust in Christ, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, it's a new start. Whether you use the language of being born again, of new creations, it's a new start. And as we turn to Christ, we have a new relationship with God. We know forgiveness for our past sins, the things that we've got wrong. And we are equipped with the Holy Spirit so that we learn to live for God and learn to live with God. And the fruit of having faith in Jesus is that we are enabled to be a human being who better loves God and better loves our neighbours. Those first ten disciples were transformed by the presence of Jesus. So two things. Firstly, presence. Now, the first believers followed Jesus because he was physically present. But today it's not the same. Because, of course, Jesus has ascended to the Father's right hand. We'll be remembering that in two and a half weeks' time. Jesus is not walking around in the same physical frame as he was in the first century. But when we become Christ followers, when we become Christians, when we put our faith in Jesus, we are given the Holy Spirit. God's very presence dwells in us to help us to know the full life that Jesus promised and he also is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, our eternal inheritance, as it says in Ephesians 1.14. The presence of God's Spirit in us means that we carry God's very presence. Does that freak you out slightly? But that's what the Bible teaches. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, described Christians as God's temple. Now, in the Old Testament, the tent of meeting, and later the temple, was the place where the Israelites could come into the very presence of God. That's why it was the center of their life and worship as the people of God. For them, God's presence dwelt there, and it was their access to his presence. Now, of course, God is everywhere, but... It was a special place for encounter with God. It was the focus of their life of worship and prayer. It was the place of sacrifice. It was the place of inquiring of God and the place for honouring him. For Christians it's different because Jesus changes everything. Do you remember on the cross, the curtain was torn in two and that's the curtain that enables you to go into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place where God's presence dwelt. The cross rips that curtain in two so that access is now there for everyone who trusts in Christ. So, the presence of God now is no longer found in a place, 
but in people. Put another way, Jesus came and revealed God by his presence. And as those who've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's now our job to reveal God's presence as we carry his presence, as we carry his spirit, as we walk with him. So, how do we do that? That's the key thing, isn't it? How do we do that? Do we just hang around being super spiritual? You know, look at me, I'm a really spiritual person and acting as though we're superior to everyone else. Of course not, I don't think so. We cannot be superior to anyone. We are all sinners, saved by God's grace. God's kindness, as it's revealed in Jesus. But as we follow Jesus, he has commanded us to show God's love in our lives. We are to be people of God, who are people of love, who love our neighbours as ourselves, even loving our enemies. Putting another way, we are to enable others to have an encounter with Christ because of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yes, I'm putting a lot of weight on us this morning as God's people. For most of us, if we think about how we came to faith, it was at least in part because others reflected Jesus to us in some way. For some of us, it was perhaps our parents' faith as they lived out their faith day by day in front of us. We saw their trust in Christ, their relationship with him, the difference he made to their lives. Of course, no parents are perfect. Uh, I remember at Theological College, one of my lecturers, who was a lecturer in psychology, a professor of psychology, he lectured us, and the, I, I don't remember anything he said from a whole year of lectures except one thing. Uh, so it was obviously really good lectures. Uh, and, he, and he said, there's one thing. He said, we have this concept of good enough parenting. Uh, and we don't have to be perfect as parents. But we have to be good enough. And most of us are. So that's just the good news. The point is that uh, as parents, we do reflect to our kids when we get do the job right. We do reflect to our kids Almighty God and his love. I can tell you of many who follow Christ because of the examples of their parents in following Christ. We all know that even if we have the best parents in the world, they aren't perfect, but they still reflect Jesus to us. And we thank God for them. It works the other way too. Our children can be a blessing to parents as they reflect Christ to us. Uh, I remember when I became a, a Christian, I was an 18-year-old um, at university, and I went home for the Christmas holidays. And I was determined to let my face show. And I quickly discovered that by telling my parents all about my faith, that didn't really cut it, because they knew me too well. I could tell them about Jesus till I was blue in the face, because they knew what I was really like. My faith had to be lived out in front of them. So I did actually have to help with the washing up. <laughs> I did have to try to live for Jesus at home if I wanted them to actually seriously explore the Christian faith. And my mum did say some time later that she could see that being a Christian had made a difference in my life. She didn't go into details, so it might have been I just went to church more often. But I'm hoping it was more than that. And I remember a story at our local church. Um, uh, a woman had, had come to faith um, uh, through the church, church's ministry. And about two years later, John the vicar had a very irate phone call from a chap who, who was her husband, and he demanded to see the vicar. And so John was, to say the, nerve, uh, to say the least, twitchy about this. And um, so they arranged a meeting, and he turned up. And he said to John, this is two years after she became a Christian, he said, I want to know what's happened to my wife. And he became a Christian too. See, you see, she lived it out by her presence. She revealed Christ in her, the hope of glory. She was just the best mum and wife that she could be. 
with God's help. And that touched her husband so that he came to faith in Jesus. Uh, and the other thing is, another place where we go, where we rub up against people, is our place of work. Now, living out our faith at work can be really challenging. You know, living it out if people are actually going to come to faith can be quite hard. But remember, in our Bible reading, Peter and Andrew and James and John were all at their place of work when they were called to follow Jesus. It will not do for us to say, well, I'm a Christian at home and I do it in my social life, but at work it's too hard to actually let it show. That presence of evangelism that Jesus brought to Peter and Andrew and James and John mattered to them while they were at work. So what are you like at work? Are you and others at work aware that you carry the presence of God when you're in the office or in the workplace? Have you grasped that your presence in the office or your workplace actually changes the atmosphere? Because you carry the presence of Christ, you carry God's presence with you wherever you go. Do you grasp that when you go into your place of work, you change the atmosphere? Not because of you, but because of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Have you grasped that? Because if we grasp that, it then means that in the workplace, rather than being fearful, we can be confident when others ask us about it. What did you do at the weekend? Actually, we went to this rather good baptism service. The preacher went on a bit long, but the baptism was great. <laughs> you know, it, it is owning your faith. We had this thing in our family, and, and it was really difficult, and we prayed about it, and we saw God work, and it was such a blessing. Or we had that friend that went through a really difficult time, but as we prayed with them, as we prayed for them, we saw God help them through it. Or even, we had a very dear friend who died. But we knew that God was with them on that final journey. We prayed for them, we prayed with them, we stood with them, we loved them, as God welcomed them into glory. We always talk about death in a negative way. But as Christians, we can talk about it positively, because the hope we have in Christ. And the promise that Jesus will travel with us, as we read in John 14, he says, I'll come back to take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. Do we ever talk like that at work? I want to give us confidence and encouragement to not be afraid to do that. Because it's all about sharing that presence of God in all of our lives. And not being afraid to be confident in who Christ is, what he has done for you, what he has done for your life, and what he can do for everyone else too. Remember that we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. On Friday, Chris has already mentioned, we're going to be welcoming the LICC, London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, to Jersey. Uh, and that event on Friday, uh, I know I've harped on about it a bit, is going to be very good and really worthwhile. And one of the main focuses is on helping, one of their main focuses as a ministry is on helping Christians reflect their faith in the workplace. And they say of Friday evening that it's going to be a place to show how living as disciples of Jesus can transform the way we say, see our daily life and our work. And on next Sunday, we're going to be welcoming Ken Benjamin uh, of LICC is our preacher at our services. I'm really looking forward to what Ken will be bringing to us. You see, presence, our presence, can make a difference and help others to begin to explore faith in Christ. I, I also asked Chat GBT, GPT, uh, the AI online, um, what presence evangelism was. 
Now, you might think that's a strange thing to do. Chat GPT, for, you, for those of you who don't know, um, is an artificial intelligence online. And it seems to have read almost every book from the last 2,000 years. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and you can talk to it and you can ask it questions. I started by asking it a question about HMS Art Royal because my grandfather was on it in the Second World War. Uh, and um, anyway, so I asked it about presence evangelism and this is part of what it said. The machine said, some examples of presence evangelism include volunteering in the community, participating in social activities and events, and simply being available to listen and to support those around us. By building relationships in this way, Christians hope to demonstrate the transformative power of the gospel in their own lives and invite others to experience the same love and grace that they have received. For a machine, it got it about right, didn't it? <laughs> it learned well. So what about us? Are we learning well? Chat GPT may be able to type the right things, but it will never live it out or put it into practice. As Christ followers, we can. We want people to know Jesus and experience the same love and grace that we have received from God. That is why Jesus' presence changed it for those disciples. And that's why Jesus' presence changes it for us. And because we are in Christ, our presence changes it for others. Let me pray. Loving Father, thank you that you call us to share in the work and ministry of Jesus by simply being who we are in Christ. And I pray you would help us, Lord, to grasp that we carry your presence uh, and that we go as your representatives, your emissaries, indeed your apostles sent by you to be witnesses to who Jesus Christ is, to all he has done and what he means for us all. So help us, Lord. Help us tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock at the coffee machine at work. Help us at the school gate. Help us as we're talking to our neighbours. Help us when the children aren't quite doing it right. Help us, Lord, in all the situations we find us, to find ourselves, to represent you, to reflect your presence. And we ask this for your glory. Amen.